This uh, tree, yes, I drew it. Um, the original is owned by a bank, and it's about four times the size of what you have in your hand. Uh, <clears throat> if I'm standing beside it, I'm about an inch tall compared to the drawing. Okay, and I'll explain it in a minute. Um, <clears throat> God has been really bugging me about the tree of life. And uh, Judy said last week, she says, Oh, the tree of life, I've been thinking about that a lot. So maybe this would be good for both of us. But um, I've really, for years, had a love for trees. I have this passion for trees. In that... <clears throat> When I was a kid, we, lived, we moved into a new subdivision, and we were one of the first houses out there, and they were building houses. And you know how there's always piles of wood and scraps and lumber? Well, they didn't care if I got any, so I'd get all the lumber I could stand and nails and hammer, and I built me a cool tree house in the middle of an oak tree. And I spent a lot of happy hours in a tree. <laughs> And so, I don't know, I've just always had this serious love for trees. They're beautiful, they're interesting, there's a zillion kinds of them. And according to the statistics, there are over 400 billion of them on our planet at present. That's a lot of trees. And so, this particular drawing that you have in your hand, um, I saw it, it's on the Gulf Coast. It's um, pretty near where uh, Jackson Colony is. If anybody knows, it's a group of people from Jackson that own property uh, down on the Gulf Coast. And it's like a little community of, of beach houses. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this thing is in the median between Highway 90 East and West. And I saw this tree and just thought it was gorgeous. And <clears throat> Camille came along. Now, I'm old enough to remember Cam Camille. It was not as big a storm as Katrina, but it, the winds were far more powerful. It was very concentrated. And uh, this tree survived Camille. And if you look at it, you can see the trunk has been twisted much like a bath cloth wrung out with water. But it still was there after Camille. I went down and found it. And this thing is, is a really neat old tree. It's even after Camille and all the stuff that happened to it, you could still go down in the sand and pick up old, big old acorns about the size of your thumb it still had life in it. And so I found myself just, you know, it was, it was like an old friend. And I was glad it made it through Camille. And then later on, Katrina comes along. And I had done a drawing of this tree, as you see there, and had made limited edition prints and sold out of those. And I've called it the overcomer for a reason because it has overcome everything that has happened to it. And after Katrina, uh, I went down there on the coast and I had to see if my tree was there. Guess what? It's alive and well, and you could go down and see it in this afternoon if you wanted to. So my point being is that trees survive for a reason. Overcoming is something we're asked to do. 
And so this fascination with the tree of life that God's kind of got me chewing on, he gives me kind of subjects. I'll kind of get to, to working on them. I don't know if y'all work that way or not, but, but he does with me. So um, the overcoming happens because the, the tree has roots. It has a lot more parts to it than just the roots. But whatever is above ground, there's that much below ground. And trees pass through seasons, of course, as you know. Uh, in the winter, they look dead. The sap goes down, according to all the forestry people. And what, what happens in a tree in winter is that it is growing new roots below the surface where you do not see it in the secret place. That's just like we talked about. Growing new roots in the secret place below ground. The top of the tree looks dead, but it's not. And I've learned in winter, which is the scariest place for us as people, because it's like everything's dead and hard and cold, and you pray a prayer and it bounces off the ceiling, hits you in the head, etc., etc., etc. I've learned to sit in the shed and sharpen my tools because I have learned spring will come again. Just like for the tree, it's putting down new root systems, it's getting a better grip and going for deeper nutrients and water. Roots seek nutrients and they seek water. So the tree goes through winter. I go through winter. You go through winter. And then in the spring, buds appear, leaves appear, and it has got the root system to support what the tree needs to now have for outward appearance, so to speak, public life. This is the same thing I was trying to get across in, in our study in there. Secret places of the roots into the soil of God and the, the leaves and all of the flowers and the fruits and stuff that, that trees put out. That's the public part. And of course, it takes summer uh, heat to ripen and sunlight, and then fall has a harvest. We'll, that's something we may get into another time. But this old tree and I have big buddies, and I want to use it to kind of get us to thinking about trees in general, but specifically the tree of life. Um, if you'll get your Bible out, uh, let's go to uh, Genesis 1, 11 through 12. Genesis 1, 11 through 12. <clears throat> and for the sake of time, I'm going to take off reading. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after this, its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Trees are mentioned, I don't know, over 400 and something times in the Bible from start to finish. And if we look then... Um, Let's go to 29 and 30 Verse. of Genesis 1, uh -huh, 29 and 30, and let's look at that. More about trees. Um, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in which is the fruit of a tree-yielding seed. And to you it shall be for me, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, therein there's, there is life. I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. Of course, God said it was good. All right, so we've got trees, we've got seed, we've got 
all sorts of things that uh, God presents to us right from the very start of his word having to do with him being a farmer having to do with being a, a person who plants and grows there's two big themes in the in the Bible that he uses to represent himself one of them is as a shepherd and one is as a farmer a gardener we think about Jesus being resurrected from the dead what was he mistaken for immediately gardener. the gardener where did we start in a gorgeous garden um, we like nature we're meant to like nature. We left the garden in sin. We're coming back to a garden in righteousness. I'm very excited about that. We love the outdoors. I went and bought property, 42 acres, because it had a pond, beautiful hardwood trees everywhere, a 30-foot wide uh, creek across the back nine acres, wildlife everywhere, birds singing. Man, I'm at home. It's the closest I can get to the Garden of Eden this side. I like it out there. I buy calendars, and you do too, with these beautiful photographs of nature, uh, scenery, everything from from, you know, the ocean to the mountains to, to fields of flowers and all that because we're drawn to gardens. We're drawn to what God originally put us in to live in. And so, as a result, we find ourselves with this kind of inner itch for all the things, the trees and the flowers and the land and such. In fact, it's so neat if you realize God starts off the day with what's called warm colors and he ends it with warm colors. When the sun rises, you've got beautiful oranges and reds and yellows and what have you. And I teach art, so uh, I think about things in terms of art a lot. When the sun comes up, the warm colors do something to us physically that we have no control over. If we have normal color vision, warm colors, reds, yellows, and oranges, they excite us physiologically. Our eyes dilate, our blood pressure goes up, our hair grows faster, our respiration goes up, heartbeat goes up. It's an excitement to see warm colors. What happens at the end of the day? Same thing. Another day for God. Another day in His presence. And in between are cool colors. Blues, greens, and violets. And they do the exact opposite to us. What they do is they calm us down. You ever been upset and you go for a walk? And you see the grass and the trees and, and the blue sky and you feel better when you get back. It's God's doings for us because during the day is when things are most active and we need the <laughs> most amount of peace and calm, I think. So all of this stuff says nature, trees, God's plantings for us. Well, I'm working on this tree of life thing and I found the Lord saying to me that our journey as believers must end with pleasing Him when we meet Him face to face. What do we want to hear from Him? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And what would make Him say that to us? Been good and faithful. In the end, we have an audience of one to play to. To please him, and that's it. Not please people, not worry about all that, but please him. So this idea of doing and being and participating in what he has for us brings his pleasure. And I fell in love with him, and I find I want to do 
what he loves. And so as a result, I find myself uh, realizing that the tree of life has a whole lot to offer. Um, I told y'all when I was teaching uh, about the uh, Psalm 22, 23, and 24 as the sandwich in Scripture and talking about the Lord as shepherd. But in Psalm 22, verse 6, Jesus says, I am a worm and no man. And I thought that was the strangest statement. But the worm he's talking about there is a tolar worm, which is the worm that was crushed to get yeah. purple dye, the color of royalty. And <clears throat> you'll find that this dye was incredibly expensive. Incredibly expensive. And so Jesus says, I am a worm. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, which means a place of crushing. And he, his very body juices are crushed out of him. And he is bleeding sweat and blood. And any medical doctor, as I told y'all, he's beginning to die. That is a very few people survive that much pressure and stress. But the point in telling you this is where did he go? He went to Gethsemane, which literally means a place of crushing, an oil press. The trees that were there where he went into the garden, notice he went to a garden to commune with his father, and what was there? Olive trees. There were two kind of trees in the Garden of Eden. There were many trees as far as types of fruit trees and you know flowering trees. But two trees are really emphasized in the Garden of Eden. One is the tree of life, and the other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We all know this. But the thing about the tree of, of life is that it teaches us and is built on faith. The soil in which that tree of life reaches is faith. The tree of knowledge and good and evil is our sight, not faith. Remember the scripture says we're to live by faith, not by sight? Well, of course, when, it, when the scripture, if you look at it in Genesis, it says that their eyes were opened and they saw good and evil. Before that, they had only faith. And that was the sufficient, pleasing thing that they needed to be in God's presence. Joe was talking about faith this morning. So this tree of life represents trust and faith in God himself. He is the source. He is the tree. And then the tree of knowledge and good and evil is where our sight and our judgment and our preferences and our ways and our thinking and all that kind of stuff comes into being. And that's where we get in trouble. It represents our mind our thoughts, our ways, and our understanding. And that's where we get messed up. Right? Okay. So, here's the deal. Adam was told to keep the garden. To tend to it. We know the story about Adam and Eve eating from the tree. I believe it to be a fig tree. Fig trees are mentioned throughout the scripture. They stand for Israel and humanity. Jesus comes along in the New Testament and what does he do? He curses the fig tree. Why? Because it doesn't work. It does not produce life. It does not have its seed in him. It's, it's, it's doing its own thing. Jesus comes along in the New Testament 
It says the axe is laid to the root of the tree. He, cur he looks for fruit, something good on it, the early figs. They're not there. He says, wither and die, and the apostles are freaked out that the next morning it's gone. But this tree of life was standing in front of the tree, the fig tree. Of course, Jesus is the tree of life. He's the source of our life. And <clears throat> go over to uh, uh, Revelations. Let's go over there for a minute. In chapter 22, let me see where my verse is. I won't. Um, go to 22, 1 and 2. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil were in the garden. In the end, the tree of life is on both sides of the street and there is no tree of knowledge of good and evil. Isn't that good news? It has been cut down and abolished by Jesus. So, Adam and Eve were to have no involvement with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, only with the tree of life. So as a result, they weren't to touch it. They weren't to eat of it. Why? Because evil has its own fruit. Right? I think God is a very accurate, accurate uh, person when he describes something. For example, um, uh, the robes on the priest had pomegranates hanging on them and a bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, bell, all the way around. I always wondered why pomegranates. Was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil a pomegranate? No. Nope. Pomegranates have 613 seeds in them. Guess how many laws there were? 613 seeds in a pomegranate. So God's always accurate. So this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and most people want to think of it as the old apple. Mm -hmm. I believe it to be a fig because throughout the scripture, fig seems to be identified with human stuff and human things. Um, I have gotten to the place in my life where I see people coming and they are covered in fig leaves. Adam and Eve sin. Their eyes are open. Time starts. Before that, everything was immortal. Time started. It's like everything went downhill and just came to a screeching stop. Time began. They used to be dressed in light. It says God is light. He emanates light. There is no darkness in him because he is totally illuminated. Moses comes down after being in his presence. Uh, from the uh, mountain. He's like a laser. They have to cover his face. He's so bright. So Adam and Eve were once dressed in light. We talked about in the Bible study an aura of God. The presence of God being so there until you're covered with it. Covered with Him. And in this, in this deal where Adam and Eve fell, the lights went out. They were naked. And what did they begin to do? Try and cover themselves. And because they were naked, they were exposed, and they felt judged. They were guilty. How many of you know you want to hide when you feel guilty? Tons of folks, <laughs> you know, want to hide. 
And I have realized that when, <laughs> and y'all may think this is terrible, but when Adam went to look for something to cover himself and Eve, he grabbed the biggest leaves he could find. Fig leaves. They're big old things. He didn't go for pine needles. He went for fig leaves. Right? I will not comment on that further. But they begin to try and take care of their own shame and their own sin and their own problems. And so they dressed in fig leaves and I have gotten to the place where I hear people coming who rustle when they walk, covered in dried, dead fig leaves. In fact, I have a little suit I made one time of fig leaves. And when you walk, it swishes and makes noise. And I see people with two eyeballs sticking out of all these fig leaves they're wearing. And they're hiding under there. And I see it all the time. I'm sure y'all do too. But some of them hide under money. Some of them under power. Fame. Degrees. How many times in the academic world do I see well, I have my doctorate. Okay. That's it. I'm a master plumber. <laughs> Whatever. And, and I see them with uh, hiding under possessions. Man, I got me a Lamborghini. Ooh, I'm something else. Or, you know, the latest sports car, or whatever. Or, I'm wearing a Rolex. Or, I've got, you know, a silk suit that was handmade for me. Or, whatever it is. Man, I got a, you know, million dollar home. Well, okay. Whoopee. So, what? In the end, it's not going to matter because we want to hear Jesus say, Well done. Welcome. Right? So, these fig leaves are a result, this fig tree is a result of our own mess. And thank God, if you read through Revelation, you will find that that fig tree goes away and on both sides, the tree of life has taken root and has got water. And it's great. I'm so glad. So the, so the thing about uh, the fig leaves is that it's, it, it's our effort. It's our doings. It has nothing of life in it. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot cover our own sin. We know the story where God comes along and he says, uh, to Adam and Eve, they've gone and jumped in the, covered themselves in fig leaves and jumped in the bushes. And he says, where are you? yoo It wasn't that he had lost them. They didn't know where they were. He knew exactly where they were. But what he did was say, do you know where you are? They did not know the mess they were in. And of course, he takes the initiative then to do the first sacrifice of a lamb. And the lamb's sacrifice, the lamb dies, as we know, and they are covered in the skins. The blood sacrifice, well, of course, it was, it was foretelling of Jesus' uh, death on the cross and for him to be the tree of life for us and to, to save us from our own mess. One of the things God's got me looking at, the Torah is rolled in scrolls, right? The two posts that go through the Torah are called the tree of life. That they're literally, the, the parchment is wrapped around. Notice it's two both sides of Revelation Street. You with me? Mm -hmm. So the tree of knowledge of good and evil will be done away with totally. He's already done it officially. And we will experience only the tree of life 
in the next garden we go to. And I'm excited about that because I like trees. Okay? Well, parchment is the inside layer of lambskin. From the very day, the first five books of the Bible are called the Torah. And those five books were written on parchment, the inside layer of lambskin, wrapped around the tree of life. And if that's not Jesus, I don't know what is. This tree of life is, is incredibly Jesus. And I'm digging into it and trying to, trying to discover what we can learn from this tree of life. I know that, that he's got me looking at soil because dust, says we're made from the dust, right? The dust there in the Hebrew literally stands for the Adama. It's the same word we get Adam from. It means the particles of the universe. If you look at everything in our earth, it all comes from the basic elements and structures of chemistry. The Adama. And all of this stuff, this dust, it says from dust you came and dust you will return. But guess what? Dust is not soil. Dust is waterless stuff. So what does it connect with the tree of life? What flows from between? Water is crystal clear and pure as it comes. When you mix water and dust, you get soil. Soil in which roots can take hold. The uh, trunk begins to form and there's multi-layers of the trunk. The very heart of it is the strength and skeleton of the tree. Goes up to branches and then leaves and fruit and all of that stuff. And so I'm digging into all this and God's really giving me some stuff I think that's, it's, it's helping me, I'll tell you now. So what we want, we want to have nutrients that come through this tree of life to us so we can produce fruit. We've been talking about the gifts of the Spirit and functioning in a way that, that we see Jesus uh, portrayed through our lives. And this dust, if we add water to it, it becomes soil. And it becomes the very thing that feeds us the life of Jesus. And our tree is the tree of life rather than our tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I want to be a tree for Jesus. I want to be part of the tree of life, not this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want to spend my life dressed in fig leaves, trying to cover up myself or my own stuff. I want Jesus' answers and his very life to be my source. And I'll tell you what, um, Satan, of course, was told he would eat dust all the days of his life. And what does it say about him? It says he wants to find waterless places. If he can keep us dust and take us back to dust, he'll do it every time. But when you add dust and water, the living water of Jesus, you get soil and something grows in soil. We find in there all through Genesis the soil, the land, the earth, and it came forth, and it came forth, and it came forth, and it came forth. It came forth. It's everywhere in there. So that's what I'm after. I'm after for the, the tree of life. <clears throat> I want to eat from it because it's immortality. It's eternal life and it's eternal relationship with God. Guess what the fruit of the tree of life is? The moving of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that pretty neat? That the fruit would be the Holy Spirit function. 
I like that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if, we, if we reject Jesus' shed blood, we're cut off from the tree of life. But, if we if we let Jesus' life flow through us and accept what he's done for us, then we have the tree of life and we're part of it and we're fruit and we see the Holy Spirit and the whole nine yards. And I'm excited about it. Uh, he said that we're to eat from the tree of life. We can get back to eating what's hanging on that tree. Okay? When the Torah is held up in the synagogues, you can look at Proverbs 3, 13 through 18, it is chanted over by the Jewish people. And here's what they say. A tree of life to those who hold fast to it, and all who cling to it find happiness. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Help us and guide us, inspire us and provide us with the wisdom your Torah can show, your word. Cause us to learn, to renew and return, just as in the days of old. So the parchment, the Word of God, the Lamb of God, wrapped himself around the tree of life. He is the tree of life. In contrast to Satan being in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I'm so glad that at the end, the tree of knowledge and good, of evil, good and evil no longer exists. That does good for me. Okay? Now, just to give you a hint, here's 20 pages of what I've learned about the tree of knowledge of good and, e good and evil. You don't want to hear it this morning. But there's a lot of stuff that is connected with it. So I wanted to kind of just offer to you this idea that we need to look at this in depth. I don't know whether we'll do it in Bible study or whatever, but this, this tree of knowledge of good and evil is bad and to be rejected. And the tree of life is to be what we hold on to. So just like the Torah, there are two posts, two wooden posts. Guess what happens when you put two posts together? So history, the Jewish culture has proclaimed the tree of life. Amen. I'm glad for that. Amen. Okay? Amen. I don't want to get any, any further into this right now but because it's getting a little late. But no, no. You may. Um, it's funny how you talk about the tree of life. Oh, let's shut that off. Um, is you probably heard Robbie minister once before, pastor minister once before, the, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, if we're in a tree of knowledge of good and evil, then what are we doing? Of everything I know and what I do, and you know, I'm going to judge because that's what it is. It's a tree of judgment. Mm -hmm. But if I get out of that tree and I come over here and I get the tree of life, all I can do is love. I can't judge. Um, the knowledge that I have. Yeah, the knowledge that I have, which is Jesus Christ, which is the understanding, is the olive tree, which is the tree of life. But if I'm in the olive tree and I'm getting all of this, but I'm jumping back and forth and I'm going into this knowledge of truth, good and evil tree, the fig tree, I'm going to judge. I'm going to look upon you and I'm going to, you know, John, why you do that? Why you, why you, da -da -da -da, and I'm just going to eat you up. <laughs> So if we get ourselves out of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, or because we think what we know, automatically I'm going to pass judgment. So you look on somebody, you go to judge, 
I'm using him because I know I can't offend him. <laughs> uh, if I look at him and I pass judgment upon him, I'm not in a tree of life. And my father is Satan. I got to get out of this tree, walk over to the tree of life, and love my brother. So don't pass judgment. You're passing judgment in the wrong tree. That's all. Amen. Okay. <laughs> well, let's pray. Come on. Father, I thank you that you share Jesus with us as the tree of life. That he's planted and steady and rooted so that we can be in him. I thank you, Lord, that you give us nutrients through him. That you give us stability by way of the trunk. That you reach out with branches that we can see you and participate and find life in you produce beautiful things and serve to, to produce fruit that will please you, that you will say one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Our desire of our heart, Father, is to please you and to offer your life to as many people as possible. And Father, I pray for the secret place for all of us that we can begin to, to fellowship and, and literally like that old tree house I built, live in that tree, Lord, to be a part of your life and the things that you do. And I thank you so much that at the end, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is destroyed. And it will no longer be a tree that we even have a choice for that it will be set free from it. And I thank you that Jesus has done the work that you shared him with us. Jesus, we thank you for going to the tree and buying us back and putting us back in a garden to fellowship with you and love you and be a part of your world. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and administer all this to us that you move on us and that you produce fruit in that tree. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.